somebody watching right now, it could be like, okay, well, like, how to make the money? You know, yes. like, how do I get the lead? Yeah. But this is how you get the lead. The first thing is find your uniqueness, figure out what you're good at, then extrapolate that into a product, you know, create your service, your product offer, you may already have that. And then- How do we start the process of monetizing our side hustle? Dude, this is such a good, a good that's such a good question, because that's the thing, right? It's like, we want to make money, we want to help people, we don't want to be the desperate salesperson. <laughs> Please buy my thing out of pity. Yeah, yeah. we don't want to be the, the, the needy guy. And, and um, you know, and this is something that I've spent my whole life doing. I went door to door. So I worked in retail sales when <laughs> right. I was like, from my time I was like 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And then I spent five years going door to door, 14 hours a day, six days a week, um, interrupting people. 14 hours a day, door 14, to door. 14 hours a day, door to door you know, interrupting people and like, you know, pretty intrusive. Um, as I sometimes say that being a door to door salesperson is like being the human version of email spam. Right. <laughs> right, know, right. Like, right. Telemarketer. Yeah, or phone, telemarketer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like telemarketers are, you know, <laughs> then us, we, we bug, we're, we bug telemarketers when they're eating dinner. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, we built a sales coaching company to eight figures, teaching salespeople how to sell. How do you generate leads? And then brand builders, we do more like, marketing and mm -hmm. digital lead generation, but whether you're like a Fortune 100 company, a personal brand, a professional service, or just a person with a dream for a side hustle, this is the question. How do you make that first sale? Like, how do you get money? Where, mm -hmm. do, you, where do you find the people? And before you answer that, okay. what was the greatest lesson you learned going door to door for five years? <sighs> about uh, yourself and about selling in general? Um, you know, there, there was this, this thing that we, we used to say all the time <laughs> that the, the answer's behind the next door. <laughs> <laughs> you never stop. Um, it, there's always another door. Yeah, you just keep, you'll find the answer in the next place. Yeah, it, it was always like, <laughs> but that, that, that part of it, I think actually was, is good. Of, uh, Cause this is, this is true about sale. I mean, the, a part of the good news for both marketing and sales, um, is that they are both a numbers game. Mm. They are a numbers game. It, it's not like it won't work, right? Like you have the, the fear like, is anyone gonna buy this? No, somebody will buy. No matter mm -hmm. how bad you are or how crappy your thing is, right, if right, you right. talk to enough people, which is not what the goal is, uh, but that, 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 that people will, yeah. they, they really will buy right. if you keep going. The truth about uh, most sales is it's, people think of it as like combat, like, you know, I either have to put the mi the magic marketing words on the page, mm -hmm. or I need to say like the, the the voodoo mind trick to like convince you to buy something, and then it's kind of like this battle, um, mm -hmm. and it's more like an Easter egg hunt, right. um, where it's like there is some number of eggs out there in the field that have candy in them, and no matter if you did anything or not to deserve candy being in there, they're just there. You just have to go find them. Um, and there's a lot of empty eggs along the way. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot that you're going to open and it's empty. And, and so that is that is one part of it. But I, the, the biggest problem, the, the, the biggest problem that people have in selling is that they're self-centered. Mm. The reason we don't sell more is because we're focused on how do I make money? You know, how do I convince people? And it's, it's, it's we approach it wrong and i would say that sales has been taught wrong done wrong promoted wrong i mean you know we're big fans of cleaning this up and changing yeah. the way that people think about it i think we're it. also self-centered in the fact that we're afraid of people saying no and how it will make us feel about ourselves yes. when they say no absolutely yeah when i say self-centered part of that is kind of like the you know i don't necessarily mean selfish like i'm going to take in, in, in for me instead of you, although there's a part of that where it's like, you know, the sale is convincing people to buy something mm -hmm. they don't want, right? right? That's not that's not what we're into. Right. Um, but it's it's also fear is self-centered. Fear is extremely self-centered. Oh, man. You only feel fear when you're thinking about yourself. You know, we say there is no fear when the mission to serve is clear. Mm -hmm. When you're focused on helping someone else, you're not we're worried about it, right? I mean, it's like if, if, if there's a car accident and someone's on the side of the road, you run up to them, you're not thinking about how does your hair look and, you know, your clothes <laughs> or your, you know, right. is your outfit cute? You're going to help somebody. Um, we're always at our best when we're serving others. Yes. 
And one of the magic, one of the magical powers of service is that being focused on service releases our insecurities. It's so true. This is something I learned speaking on stages. I, I, I said there's probably different levels to my speaking life. There's the 13 years ago being terrified to speak in front of three people yeah. without stuttering and sweating and being nervous. And me saying, okay, I, get, I need to go learn how to get some reps speaking in front of people so I'm not nervous. Yeah. So I joined Toastmasters, which you famously got second in the world for. <laughs> I love how you Toastmasters. famously bring that up every time we talk about second place in the world. <laughs> second, place at the world second place at the World Championship of Public Speaking. True story. No big deal. Uh, and I did that for a year, and I gained confidence through the actions of repetition, of showing up, of preparing, of reviewing my, my speaking film, and just improving through reps over time. Yeah. And I remember for about seven, eight years, I was getting now paid to speak for my credibility, for my expertise through LinkedIn and everything else. And I would still get nervous for a week before a big speech. Then I got better over time and it was like, okay, it's only two days before I'm nervous. Then it was a day before. And I remember it stayed a day before, but it wasn't nerves of excitement, it was nerves of insecurity. Yeah. It's like, I'm afraid of what people are gonna think about me. And I remember asking a coach of mine that uh, I had hired for a while, he was a good friend of mine, and I said, I'm about to go on stage in an hour, I don't know why I'm still so nervous. Like. I've been doing this for 10 years, shouldn't I be over this by now? And he said, because you're focused on the way you look, not on serving other people in the audience. Yeah. And the moment, exactly what you said, the moment you start focusing on service, knowing that you will probably forget something, you might make a mistake, and not worrying about those things, know that something might happen that's not perfect, but when your heart's on service, it's hard to be nervous, as you say. Ah. Uh, Isn't that I, what it's something you said? Uh-huh, yeah, years, years ago on yes, our very first yes, interview together. Yes. But I, um, yeah, that's it. And so, so you know, somebody watching right now, it could be like, okay, well, like, how to make the money? You know, yes. like, how do I get the lead? Yeah. But this is how you get the lead: is you serve first. So, in a in a in a digital world, yes. you provide value first. Value, 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 value. Give out. In, it's it's the three E's, right? Yes. You you're putting out content that is either educational, encouraging, or entertaining, and typically some mix of all three, educational, encouraging, or entertaining. And your, the, the digital marketing strategy that we, that we employ at Brand Builders Group for Rory Vaden Personal Brand and for all of the clients that we work with, that we teach these personal brands, is teach everything you know for free, one bite at a time, but in all random order, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's not packaged in the right order yeah. as you would have in a book or a course or a workshop right. or an event. Right, you know, we've said this before, people don't pay for information, they pay for organization and application. Yes. And, and uh, we have a thing called the services spectrum, which basically says, you know, information is down here, it's free, organization is here in the middle, you can charge a little bit like in a course or a book or you know like a membership site but applications up here at the top which is like a coaching program or consulting you know like done for your services mm -hmm. application information is social media podcasting blogs youtube videos YouTube. Yeah. people don't pay for information um but you're just giving them bite-sized chunks of information you're, you're you're teaching everything you know but not all at once in in the right sequential order people pay for the right order that's that's organization i mean you know we tell one of the reasons people hire us at Brand Builders Group is because is because we have a, a very set curriculum, the Brand Builder Journey, and we say, look, one of the biggest problems with personal brands is that people do the right thing, but in the wrong order. Mm -hmm. they, they're like launching Facebook ads the, the first month, and it's like, that's step 76. You're like, yeah, you skipped all a, of this. They don't have a funnel yet, so they're yeah. launching it to nothing. Yeah, you're driving it back to nothing. Yeah. You're, you're spending all this time on social media driving back to nothing. So the first thing is find your uniqueness, figure out what you're good at, then extrapolate that into a product, you know, create your service, your product offer, you may already have that. And then after that, it's like, okay, how do I drive traffic? If we're, we're, and there's two worlds here. When I think of marketing and sales, I think of the online world and the offline world. And mm -hmm. we've done both, which mm -hmm. is rare. Right. Most of the people have done one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's like, we, I've done the door-to-door -door thing, 
Um, I worked for a, a startup IT company doing inside corporate B2B phone sales. Then when we started our former company, we did um, phone sales like um, B2B for like small businesses and we did free presentations and we sold. But the, mm-hmm. the fastest mechanism to generating a lead is to do a free presentation demonstrating your value, your expertise. It's giving people a sample and then offering them the next step. Yes. Here's what it is. It is the food court. When you go to the food court. Want some orange chicken. And the orange <laughs> chicken on a stick. Man, tastes good. I want the whole thing now. It's a sample. And if you want more, Man, I'm right here. Sees candy gets me every time. <laughs> Get you a free piece of candy just going to the store and you're like, ooh, I want the whole box. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's and, and it's a free presentation. You can do this through many different mechanisms. It used to be free workshops in person. Speaking, and by the way, like when I say this is, this is what everybody does, like. This is what Jim Rohn did, and Tony Robbins, and Brian Tracy, and Tom Hopkins, and, and like everybody in the personal development industry, they used to go do, which this is how we built our former this company. This is what people in real estate industries do. They, they do they, it. They teach at a free seminar. Free a, seminar. A 90-minute live free training. Financial advisors do this. Yes. Come to your the, my free dinner yeah. presentation on 10 keys to retirement. Why? Because it works. Yes. Like you're giving value, and you're leveraging the law of reciprocity, mm-hmm. right? As um, as I give to you before, instead of ask, you don't. The way you make sales is by giving so much that at some point they like ask you to buy, nah. versus showing up and asking all the time. In fact, we use a, a rule called uh, we call it the rule of ten, and this is a pricing. This is more of like a pricing thing. But you know, people get really weird around price and asking for the money, and you know, when it comes to collecting a credit card, and or or if you're on like a webinar mm. or or a Facebook Live, or if you're, it doesn't matter if it's Facebook Live, it's a webinar, it's a video funnel, or it's standing on stage, or it's talking to one person. You got to be convicted in the value you're bringing, and the way you do that is by over delivering. The number one way to drive your own conviction is over delivering. And everyone teaches sales as like, you know, the voodoo mind tricks on the person you're talking to. Mm-hmm. The real game is the mind is winning the, the, the battle in your own mind and being convinced that what you have is valuable. And the rule of 10 helps you do that. So basically, when people are putting together their first offer, they tend to like swing for the fences and go, well, I'm going to charge for $2, 000, a $2,000 video course or something. And they say, well, I saw a video and, you know, my coach told me charge what you're worth. That's terrible advice. <laughs> don't charge what you're worth. What should we charge? When you're starting out, don't charge what you're worth. Charge what you can get. Mm. Charge what you're convicted on. Charge what you can massively over-deliver upon. Yeah, yeah. If I'm charging what I'm worth, there's going to be a bit of reluctance when I deliver the price. They're going to feel it, mm-hmm. and it's going to massively reduce the percentage conversion. Yeah, someone once told me charge what... Um, 10x the value. Yeah, that's the be, rule of 10. Right? So it's like if it's a. Uh, charge got, one tenth of what it's worth. Exactly. If it's a thousand, if it's ten thousand dollars worth of value, then charge a thousand, right? That's that right. Be, and if it's a thousand dollars worth of value, charge a hundred. If it's a hundred, charge ten. So you always, you always have, uh, you know, if, if it were a bank account, you always have this like credit, this balance with mm-hmm. people. And, and you go, and it, and it starts for free. It starts on social media, which is amazing. Like yes. the, the power that social media gives us, it's not that you have to reach millions of people. It gives us a mechanism to push a button and deliver value. Yes. Because it's like people go, is it, it's like a chicken or the egg. How do I build an audience? You know, I want to provide value, but I don't have an audience. No, you provide value first. If, if nobody is watching, you record and you teach value, you deliver it, and people will engage with that. Um, now we have a process, uh, which I'm happy to talk about, yes. of converting comments into customers. Mm. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you want to take this more like online or if you want to do like more offline. I think online is cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that. So, you know, it starts. It starts with the mind. Okay. Self-centeredness is the problem. Service-centeredness is the solution. Yes. Um, you never feel fear when the mission to serve is clear. You get your mind right. Then you go, okay, I'm gonna go out and provide value. So you start p- p- pumping out value. Um, we have a thing called the content diamond, which I know I've talked about on other episodes. We can touch on that. But anyways, you're putting out value. And now what happens is people like and comment. 
And what most of us do is we go six views. Right. And it's just like, I mean, and we get self-centered again. Mm. And we go, I only have six views. Jay Shetty gets like six billion views. <laughs> and I'm like, and it just makes me feel awful because I'm thinking about myself. Mm. And you know, there's like a comment. And then and you're like, <laughs> and you're like, I don't have a t I don't and, and then and then what we do are like, I don't have time to deal with these comments. Mm. You know, or someone sends you a DM and you're like, I don't have time to deal with these DMs. And you're missing it. Comments and DMs are where the sale happen oh, on social media. Right. Like the dollars are in the DMs. Ooh. The dollars are in the DMs because when somebody leaves a comment. They're saying, hey, I'm interested. I'm interested. I want to know more. I like you. Whether they're not saying I want to know more or not, they're, they want to connect. They want to connect. They're coming to your door. They're knocking on your door. You got to open it. Bingo. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking it. Is You're not going to their door. They've come to you. They have come to yours. And if like if you're too busy to interact with those people, don't be on social period. Right. I mean, unless you're just doing the thing where you're going to do it for years and years and years and one day you'll have you'll have more audience, but even it's like you if you want to really impact lives, impact lives. Like that's what pisses me off is people are like, mm. "I want to impact lives." And it's like, "Great. Okay, let's put, you know, you put a video out there. Why well, don't have any followers?" Well, I don't care like I'm focus not getting paid at, to do it. Focus on one at a time. One person. You said you want to impact lives. Impact lives. There's no barrier to impacting lives. Mm -hmm. There's no barrier. It's easier than it has ever been in history to impact lives. You can, you, and you can do it with text. You can record and make it a podcast. You can do video. But you are a button from impacting. I want to change the world. Great. You're one button away. Mm -hmm. get, get busy. Mm -hmm. Right? The truth is we want to have millions of followers. We want to feel important. We want other people to respect us. And you go, let all that crap go. Just focus on what you originally said. Impact lives. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so anyways, so we use a little formula here when someone comments. Um, usually we will try to move the conversation from comments into DMs. If it's a sales conversation, if it's just chatter, we'll do right. it in comments. But when you go, I want to convert comments into customers, you do that in the DMs. So you move them over to your DMs. Send me a DM or you message them. You directly. message them and yeah. then you comment. You say, hey, I just, you know, thanks for this. I just sent you a DM. Now you might comment back on their comment related wow. to what their comment was. And then you say, by the way, I sent you, a, you know, check your DMs. I sent you a message. Okay. And then here's, uh, we call this the, the four Fs. Super, super simple. Yep. Okay. So here's the four Fs. The first F is, how did you find me? And that's it. I just say, oh, Lewis, yeah, man, thanks for leaving a comment. How'd you find me? Mm -hmm. And they're going to say something, right? They're going to say, whatever, I saw you, or I, I don't know, I, I stumbled across it organically, or a hashtag I was following, or, or whatever, right? And it's like, cool. Right. Then the second F. The school of greatness. Yeah, school, I mean, yeah, a lot of people find you if you get on the school of greatness, that's for sure. Um, and I'll say, what was your favorite part? Right? So, like, what was your favorite part of that video? So wherever they found you, I read your book, I saw this video, I, I, I read your blog, I saw you in an interview, I saw you speak somewhere, I saw your ad. I mean, if it's an ad, it's, it's probably not the favorite part thing doesn't work. But usually, well, we said you're not running ads yet because you're just mm -hmm. starting out. Yeah. So you just said, what was your, what was your favorite part? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or what's your favorite thing you've seen me teach? Or what's your favorite thing to talk about? Or, or even if you don't have that, you could say, what's your, what's your favorite thing to learn about? Mm -hmm. Which leads to the third F, which is... Tell me about your future. Tell me about your future. So in other words, what are your goals? Mm -hmm. What are you working on? Like before you try to sell somebody something, figure out what they care about. Yes. Spend time learning about them. Ask them, and, and this is what's so cool. And, and, and if, there's, if there's one defining point about our sales philosophy, and I would say specifically AJ, so my wife, She's our CEO at Brand Builders Group. Her and I were business partners in our former venture. And she is the greatest salesperson that I've ever seen. Mm. And, and I mean, she outperformed three to one record-breaking salespeople wow. in 100-year companies. Um, and her and I have a departing philosophy, a, a, a defining philosophy about sales that has caused us to separate from other people and constructs. Because we believe that you should always win the relationship 
even if you lose the sale. It's mm, good. You should always win the relationship, even if you lose the sale. And if, if you focus on making sales, you're going to feel pressure. If you focus on building relationships, man, it's going to be great. Here's the other thing. If you focus on making sales, there's wins and losses. If you focus on building relationships, there's only wins. Yeah, the interesting point to that, the longer you've been adding value, whether it be online or offline or whatever, just in the world, without needing to win the sale, the longer you'll have the ability to have someone buy that something from you later in your life. Yeah, you're I've the, had you're... multiple, yeah, I've had multiple people on webinars when I'll say, you know, how long have you known me for? I'll just ask people, how long have you known me for? And when did you first find out about me? And people will say, I watched your webinars back in 2009, 10, 11, 12, whatever it is. Awesome. And you'll I'll always get a comment of Sam saying, I've never bought anything until now. Like, I've always just been a fan. I've always gotten great value. I've always learned and applied it, but I've never bought anything until now, until it was the right time for me, it was the right season, or until I was ready for this, or until something you said clicked with me, and I finally was like, okay, yeah, now I'll buy. But if I was just like, leave my life if you're not gonna buy something now, as opposed to saying, oh, here, I'm here to add value. I want you to succeed whether you buy or not, Dude. but we can support you in this process from our application, from our service, whatever it might be, from our program. Yeah. We can support you if you're ready for it, and if not, then hey, we've got other great free content here for you as well. I think when you have that mindset, you win long-term. You, you, you win. I mean, you're, you're such a great example of that, and, and, and you have to be that, and people don't. They, they, it's just a win-lose, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a combative, you know, most people do combative sailing, selling, and it should be collaborative. It, mm -hmm. it should be you're describing them. And this question, tell me about your future. What, what, like your future goals, your future plans, your future dreams. What's so cool about that question is almost nobody ever asks you that question. Very few. Even when you meet a stranger, we always ask them, "Where are you from? Tell what do me you about do? your past. Yeah. What do you do?" We ask them about their past and their present. Almost nobody ever asks us. Mm -hmm. What's your hope for your future? Yeah. What are you working on? What's your dream? Yeah. That's so inspiring, exciting, uplifting. And by the way, it's a great way to create a context for a sale to happen. Absolutely. Because if they say something, gosh, I really want a blank. If, if their answer to that question is something that you have done or you have a service for or you know something about, Right? Like when somebody tells me I want to be a speaker, I want to be an author, I want to, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, can I change your life? Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent my life learning exactly right. a roadmap that you can follow, <laughs> like right. a step by step for that dream to come true. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things to add to that is if you can't sell them something, if they can't buy something from you or become a customer of yours through your products and services, you want to, f I always try to ask people this question, like what's your, what's your goal, what's your dream for this next 12 months or the next year or whatever. And if I can't help, help them in any way through my business, I always want to become the champion of an introduction to them who could help them. Amen. Whether, and that could be an affiliate partner or not. It could be, well, I don't do this, but Rory's team does this extremely well. Let me connect you and he can accelerate this goal for you. Um, but I've had that champion introduction mindset of like, let me just introduce to the person who I know can help you. And that always pays dividends in the future as well. You may not get the sale, you may not sell them something, but you help them accomplish their goal and they'll always be grateful. And they trust you. And, yeah. and you know, more and more, this is interesting, even if you don't have a product to sell, you can earn referral fees. Absolutely. I mean, any of us can go to Amazon and sign up for a link to like have yeah. affiliate links for everything. And lots of people have, I mean, our whole business runs on referrals. Mm -hmm. We actually, pay our clients to, if they introduce us to somebody and they sign up, we pay them. Right. Um, and that's that's becoming really, really common. That's actually a, a great tool. Referral partner marketing, if it's not slimy, mm -hmm. like you don't want it to be slimy. Again, th another thing that's kind of similar in this vein is never compromise long-term reputation for short-term revenue. Mm -hmm. Don't compromise right. long-term reputation for short-term revenue. Yes. Just because I can increase my conversion rates by adding a widget that makes it look like there's a million people commenting even though there's not actually anybody there, you know, 
I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying you should think about that. Mm -hmm. You should make a decision consciously to go play the long game. Yes. Just play the long game. Like you're saying, even if you don't, I mean, we refer people to stuff that we don't have referral partner for all the time. Right. How can I help? And, 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 and this is, you know, this is the problem is, is, is people go, how can I make money? Don't ask, how can I make money? Ask, how can I help? Yes. I'm telling you, if you, if you ask, how can I help? you'll make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. If you ask how can I make money, you may end up doing some things that are compromised. It's not that money's bad. I mean, we love money, like money is good. We're fans of money. We want lots of money. We're good at making money. We're good at making other people lots of money. We enjoy money. But money is not the goal. The mission is the goal. Mm -hmm. Service is the goal. Helping the person is the goal. And you make money as a byproduct yes. Of, of that. It's solving a problem in the world. Yes. And, and that's the, the third F oh, yeah. about so, your future goals. Okay, great. Yeah. And so then, the then fourth. fourth F is where the, 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 the close happens, the conversion, the yeah. sale, um, is a free call to action. So free, free call to action, which is like, what's your, what's your, 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 your next free step? Mm -hmm. The next free step is request a call. Yeah. The next free step is check out this, this full length training I did. Mm -hmm. The next free strep is, step is subscribe to my blog. Mm -hmm. What is the, the next free step? We always want to give them a free step, a free download, a free training, a free call. And, uh, and then eventually, you'll uh, after that, you make an offer. Mm -hmm. But whatever that free step is, typically it's going to be a free call or it's gonna be a free training. Mm -hmm. So, you know. A webinar, a training. A, a webinar, yeah, or just an a online. demo. Yeah, a demo, like we do a lot of evergreen type stuff mm -hmm. where it's just like, there's just this video out here, check it out. It's a hidden video, Right, right. here's a link to it, and they watch an, an hour-ish, could be more, could be less, but let's call it an hour, and what do we do on that hour? We drop massive value bombs on them, we're, we're delivering value, we're teaching Teach as much as you can mm -hmm. for free in the time you have, and then they're going to want to take the next step if you do a good job. Right. Now, the timing matters too. Some people say no because of timing. We actually had an event recently. Uh, there was a woman that was there. We actually, this, this came up as a topic of conversation, and we asked them, we said, okay, who's been following me for a really long time, and this is the first time you bought? And it was like a woman that was five and a half years. And then we asked, Okay, who uh, is here in this event that just found out about Brand Builders Group like recently? And there was a woman that was like, I heard you five days ago on a podcast, wow. requested a call. I'm here. And now I'm here. Wow. And it was such a great testimony of that when we don't make sales, again, a lot of times we are self-centered. We process it as I did something wrong. A huge part of whether or not they buy is the timing for them. It's not about you screwing mm -hmm. up. Like your job is give right. value, teach, and then make an offer, which we can talk about the mechanics of this all the way down to collecting the credit card. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable talking about yes. the, the nitty gritty of the sale and you, you should be able to do that without pressure. We, we call it pressure-free persuasion. The pressure-free persuasion method is, but, but just look how you're setting this up. If you're delivering value, you're teaching, you're helping, you're solving problems, there's so much less pressure yes. when the time comes to ask for money because it's like, I'm just here to help, I'm here to serve, and I've got this, this great balance built up with this person of trust because they're like, wow, you're awesome. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've watched a thousand episodes of the School Greatness podcast and never had to buy anything. Right, right. And what if someone's not selling something that requires a call or a demo? What if it's a physical product or a, 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 a lower price point of a course when maybe they wouldn't do a call. Yeah, okay, so great. So these are where you get in the different mechanics of sellies, yes. selling, which is like, there's a one-on-one -on -one sales conversation. We spend a lot of time with that. Then there is one-to-many sales presentations, selling on a webinar or in a video funnel or on a live stage. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of that. And then there is a z zero to one selling, which is you're not even there, mm -hmm. and they're on a sales page. So usually, if it's if you're trying to sell a widget and it's fairly low priced, usually um, you're not doing a one-on-one -on -one call. You're for not that. doing a one-on-one -on -one call. If you're trying to sell merchandise or a hat, yeah, or a hat or a t-shirt. Or... Yeah, I mean, 
that a lot of times, you know, merchandise or stuff. artwork is, or something, you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is creativity and yeah. how cool it is. But but selling through the written word is a skill to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've got a whole formula for this. We call it the 15 Ps, which is, um, it's basically in a, in a you, you have to understand the psychology of the decision-making process that in the absence of a dialogue through a conversation, I have to guide people through some steps. A process, yeah. And the, the biggest thing to know, it's basically copywriting is would be the word for this. When you are doing copywriting, the number, th th there's there's two, there's a few main things to focus on, mm -hmm. okay? What most people do is they focus on the features of their thing. It is this size. There are this many units. It's They're telling them about the thing. Mm -hmm. Sales is never about the thing. Sales is about what the thing does for the person, what the thing allows the person to achieve, mm -hmm. what we call the promise and the payoffs. Um, you think about it like this. There is, if, if we're going on a trip, there is the vehicle that we are in, and then there is the destination we are going to. Copywriting specifically, and sales, but in specifically copywriting, the words that we use should be more about describing the destination mm. than the vehicle. Interesting. Okay, so the vehicle is how I get there. You know, brand builders, we have a, we've got a, 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 a curriculum that is a four-phase process and there's 12 courses that we move people through, right? And it's like, nobody really cares about that. If we're working with them, it's because they want to grow their brand. They want to get more speaking gigs. They want to get book deals. They want to grow their social media following. They want to build their email list. They want to make passive income, right? Those are destinations. So the more you talk about the destinations, and the less about the vehicles, the more likely there is to sales, to, to, to um, they are to buy. So you wanna talk about the what we call the promise and the mm -hmm. payoffs, which are the destination. The other thing that you wanna talk about in your writing, if you're selling through the written word, i.e. copywriting, um, whenever you're writing a feature uh, for, the, for the purpose of persuasion, in addition to promise and payoff, you also wanna describe the problems and the pain, mm -hmm. which is basically like, if you have the vehicle and the destination, the problems and the pain are staying stuck where they're at now, mm -hmm. which again, is not about the vehicle. The, your, the vehicle is your widget, the vehicle is your thing, your service, your program, your, you know, the way that you do taxes or the way that you do health or like whatever right. your company, everyone talks about their thing. Sales isn't talking about your thing, it's talking about their, the, their payoffs and then their problem and pain. And and people really struggle when it comes to writing problem and, and pain. Um, and it's super simple. Here's how you write great pain language. Describe their life as it exists, a day in their life as it exists now in the absence of your solution. Mm. All right, so let's use personal brand since that's like what we do, right? I would say, um, you know, payoffs, promise and payoffs. You want to get, um, you want to grow you your following, following, book deal, yeah. you know, online, you know, passive Speak income. Speak on stage. But um, every day you're frustrated because you're consumed spending hours on social media and no one is listening. Uh, you are uh, frustrated trying to uh, write email copy and to find the words to describe what you do so that people will buy. Um, you are overwhelmed at all the different technology pieces you have to integrate together. Um, you are concerned that your brand isn't unique from other people's brands in the marketplace and that no one's gonna notice your stuff. Um, you don't understand how to drive traffic to your website in a predictable way, right? Like, and, yeah. and, and it's called pain because to the person that you are built to serve, when they hear it, they go, oh, oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's me. You get it. You get it. You get me. Like, this is, that is what I want. This is what I'm struggling with. And the, the more you can do that, it was, here's what's amazing. The more accurately mm -hmm. and viscerally mm -hmm. you are in your ability to articulate the problem in pain, the more naturally and likely they are to trust you that you have the solution. Not because you have the perfect widget, but because you proved that you understand their pain. And if you understand their pain so well, 
we automatically assume you must also understand the way out. Right. Which in many cases is true. Yes. The more adept someone is at, at empathizing and understanding and articulating and expressing the frustrations that you are dealing with, it is likely because they have been there themselves, they've worked with a lot of people who have been there, and they have absolute clarity about what it takes to get out of that situation yeah. to get over here. But all of marketing, sales, getting people to buy is actually pretty simple. Where do you want to go? Where are you now? Mm -hmm. That gap is the sale. Yes. If, if, if I can get them to tell me where they want to go and the frustration they're experiencing now and trying to get there, they sell themselves. And in the 4F process, you're getting them to already share where they want to go. You're Bingo. already getting some of the data, the information. And then in the free call, you can start to ask them questions, I'm assuming, of what's keeping you from being there? What's the biggest challenge you're faced with from getting there right now? Yeah, see, the beauty about sales in a human conversation, <laughs> sales, people have this all screwed up. Sales is not about being a smooth talker. Mm -hmm. It's about being a master listener. Yeah. In a sales conversation, I don't even have to tell you what your problems and pain are. I can ask you. And you'll tell me. I say, Lewis, what are you struggling with right now? What's the most frustrating thing you're experiencing? Where are you losing time? Mm. Uh, where do you feel like you're underperforming? Where is your team not executing? Right. Literally, I don't have to say a thing. You say it. But but if if you're talking, you're also buying. Right. The more you're talking, the more likely you are to buy. Wow. And I don't do anything. I ask questions. Now, in copywriting, it's a little bit different because there's not a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I have to create the dialogue on the page as if we were talking, which means I have to understand what's going on in their mind right. without being able to ask. Right. So sales is way easier. Um, marketing, you actually have to like, you know, copywriting, you have to get really good and you have to really dial this in, mm -hmm. but it's still not that hard. Describe their life, describe a day in their life as it exists in the absence of your solution. Yes. Those, that's the pain. And then by the way, when you get to the payoffs, all you do is the inverse of that. So pain and payoffs are inverse. So pain, pain is uh, I'm spending countless hours, you know, posting stuff on social media and nobody's watching. Payoff is um, my content creation process is streamlined and my audience grows effortlessly. Mm, sounds good. It's the same thing. Just turning it in inside out. Yes. But in sales, again, all I have to, I just ask. I just go, Lewis, where do you want to be? <laughs> what are you struggling with? How does that make you feel? If I could show you a way to go from where you're at to where you want to be, is that something you'd be interested in? Mm -hmm. What are they going to say? Yes, of course. They just spent however much time telling you, I want this. I have this. And you say, if I could show you how to get there, would you be interested in that? Yes. The answer is yes. I already told you this, that, that, that you know, their conversation. So it's not, and once they say that, I haven't even said anything about my widget. My widget is insignificant. Mm -hmm. It's just a vehicle to get them from here to there. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't build a crappy widget. Right. Build a freaking awesome widget. Right. Find your uniqueness. You, you know, you're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. Build something amazing. Do good work. I'm just saying that's not why people buy. Right. So do both. You should create <laughs> a great product and create great marketing yes. and create great s s selling. And most of all, it's about being service-centered mm -hmm. on what's really going to help them. Service-centered in your side hustle and in sales. The challenge is when someone might hear this, they might be saying, this sounds like a lot to do. Mm. Learning marketing, learning personal branding. All I want to do is do my thing and I just hope people like it and buy it. But it's hard to scale and grow your side hustle into a business, into a profitable seven, eight-figure business without doing marketing and sales. You can't just be the make a product it's like the starving musician who wishes that someone would just recognize them at home playing the guitar in their basement that they're the greatest in the world no one's going to come find you unless you're putting yourself out into the world consistently marketing promoting and selling yourself whether that's your talent 
your skill, your product, your solution. You've got to be willing to push yourself out there if you want to grow. Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. <laughs> like, yeah, welcome. Like, welcome to the club. Like, Success is not easy. That's why not everybody does it. Mm -hmm. Like greatness is not easy. That's why most people never get there. Mm -hmm. Like anything worth achieving is worth working for. Yes. But if this is your art, okay, if your craft is your art, very much at Brand Builders Group, I think AJ and I would consider this our craft. We have spent our life understanding the psychology of influence and helping people become more influential and helping them build their own influence, personal, you know, call it personal brand. So it's, this is our art, it's our craft. When we create the four Fs and the content diamond and the brand DNA helix and all these things that we, the 15 Ps, all these frameworks, it's our art, it is our craft. And, and, and here's what people don't, here's what artists don't understand. Marketing is art. Mm -hmm. Marketing is part of your art. Like there is the creation part, which is art. But marketing is art. Marketing is an art form. Sales, when done right, is an art form. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yes. It is beautiful to sit down and have a conversation with somebody where you go, man, I feel like I just talked to a therapist and I'm signing up for your thing, <laughs> right? right? It's, it's, not, it's not, oh my gosh, I, what you don't want people to feel like is, oh my gosh, I just got beat down by a car, used car, salesman type you don't not want, all used car yeah. salesmen are this way you they just get yeah. the bad rap but you don't want buyer's remorse yeah you you don't want to win the sale and lose the relationship yes win the relationship always even if you have to lose the sale yeah that's good but if you win the relationship you serve the person you you deprive provide value teach they will buy from you you don't even have to sell they will buy yes and for those that don't know, Rory is my like secret weapon when it comes to scaling my personal brand and really around the strategy of influence, personal brand and messaging with, with everything. For the last few years, I've worked with Rory and his team on how do we really scale School of Greatness, scale my personal brand, scale the team, scale the messaging, scale the content, the courses, the programs. How do we scale it and monetize it all better? And so I've done many two-day sessions with you, I think three or four now, two-day yeah. intensive workshop sessions on a lot of these things that you teach your clients at Brand Builders Group. And so if anyone's interested in launching a New York Times bestseller, a, a viral TED Talk, launching a course, and just getting their ideas out of their head with some clarity and focus and a process on how to scale their personal brand over time, along with many other things that you guys do. If you're thinking of doing that and you wanna build following, you wanna create content, then make sure you check out what Rory is up to. Your team is offering a free call for anyone that wants to go there. If you go to lewishouse.com slash brand call, uh, people will get on a, a free call and, and they're gonna ask you these things. What are your goals? What are your challenges? What are you, you're gonna exactly see this. What we're gonna ask. You're gonna see this in action by them trying to see like, how can they help you? How can they support you? Maybe there's something they can support you with, maybe not, but they wanna support you in making sure that even just getting on this free call will support you in getting clarity on what you want, whether you work with them or not. So if you are interested in having greater impact in the world, greater influence, you wanna earn more around your skill set, your uniqueness, and you want it to become more effortless in the act of consistently showing up on a daily basis with your business or brand or side hustle, Go to lewishouse.com slash brand call. You'll see a little video with us. It'll be a free call you can sign up for. Check it out. Uh, Rory, anything else you want to add here to bring this to a close for people who are on the, mat, uh, the mission and the path of building a side hustle, potentially turning it into a, a bigger personal brand and business for themselves? Yeah, well, just on the thing of the free call, number one, I would say, um, we, we do have several clients at this very moment on the New York Times bestseller list, which is cool. Yeah. But that most of the clients we work with are not at that level. Yes. And Ninety-seven percent of the clients we work with are not Lewis House. They're getting started. They are just getting started. They oh. are in the beginning stages, intermediate stages, like you're, you know, in more that 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 intermediate exploration. Um, uh, we do have a client also that has a viral TED talk that's going viral right now. So, right. but it's most of the people are just I'm trying to build my side hustle. I'm trying mm -hmm. to make impact. I'm trying to like help grow my business. Yeah, uh, I think we can help you. And we won't 
we won't, I want to say to them the same thing I would end this on. Don't sell someone something they don't need. Mm. And we won't. Like if you do the call and we, we don't think we can help you, we will be the first to tell you because this is what we believe. Mm -hmm. We're playing the long game. Right. And I know that your sales managers, some of your sales managers probably would never say that. And I, I may never get hired to do a corporate sales <laughs> training again. But, but this is what we believe. Don't sell someone something they don't need. Yeah. Put their need first. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. And it's worked out really freaking well for us. Yeah. And we're very young and you know, we're not the richest people in the world, but man, we, we feel so lucky mm -hmm. and to get to work with people like, I mean, for you to even say that, you know, we get to be on the inner workings of your strategy and stuff. It's, it's just an honor. So it's serve fun, people, man. Serve, serve people. You should always win the relationship. Even if you lose the sale, something that you talk about, How to be. there is no fear when the mission to serve is clear. It's hard to be nervous when your heart's on service. All these things that Rory says always rings true to me. So, Rory, appreciate you. Make sure you guys check out lewishouse.com slash brand call. Even if you're just getting on a call, maybe it's not for you. But see what the process is like for you to implement this for yourself. But if you're looking to build your personal brand, I guarantee uh, he's got a lot of great stuff for you. So check it out. It's the reason I keep coming back to you every year for some strategy on how can we continue to grow and scale and have more clarity around the next stages of our personal brand. So make sure you check out the call with all the tools and all the distractions and all the social media and all the apps and, and all the responsibilities that we have in our life. Is there a way to multiply time and to become more productive? Yeah. Yeah, there is. So, I mean, this is what you just described was my life. I mean, <laughs> this is this this was pretty much like all the things we study. I was not trying so much to solve a work the problem for the world i was trying to solve a problem in my own life just busy buried behind overwhelmed stressed frustrated no matter how fast you work you just never feel caught up um mm -hmm. no matter how many hours you didn't sleep you felt tired and you were working sluggish and trying to get it all done everything yeah you just can't it's, there's this, this frustration of like am i am i ever going to have peace like am i ever going to have mm. margin am i ever going to have space and just feeling like things are under control. And so um, we started looking at this and we started profiling uh, people that at the time we called ultra performers, which mm -hmm. were the top one percenters in different industries. And is this top 1% earners, top 100% accomplishments? Yeah, I mean, just what it's, it's kind of used that term loosely, but like, yeah. you know, if it's church leaders, it's large, you know, large church leaders. If it's athletes, it's professional athletes. If it's, if it's financial advisors, they're probably top earners. Sure, sure. So um, it's just from different walks of life. And what we found is there is a new type of thinker that has emerged that is, we call them a multiplier mm -hmm. because most people, are trying to manage time, right? Like you even hear this, you go, ah, I need, you know, I need to be better at managing my time. Time management. But you know, what's funny about that is there is no such thing as time management. There is only self-management, mm. right? You cannot manage time. There's, there, time ticks on second by second. I can't fast forward time. I can't stop it. I can't pause it. And so what we're, what this conversation really about is managing ourselves managing our decisions, managing our use of time. But even that is, is kind of a, is a first shift that needs to happen is it's not like I'm this helpless victim that is subject to the world around me who is unfairly blasting me with all this stuff. No, you're in charge. Like you, everything that exists in your life, you either said, you said yes to it in some way. So it is your responsibility and, and you created the problem, but that also mm. means that you are in charge of fixing it, right. that you have the power to change it. But what we started to realize is that most of what people have learned and uh, think about time management, I, I went so far in, as the opening line in my TED talk is I said, everything you know about time management is wrong. It's wrong because we have been taught to think about time in a, a very, you know, linear way. And the world today is much more like multidimensional. Um, when you mean linear way, do you mean focusing on our priorities? Yeah. So, so a little bit about that. So if you, if we talk, um, we, we love to take people on a quick, like history of time management yes. theory. Okay. So era one time management thinking, uh, was very one dimensional. 
Um, we refer to arrow one thinking as efficiency. So that was the strategy was I got 10 things on my to-do list. How do I crank them out faster? And time management and productivity as a body of work really develops like it comes on in the scene in like 1950s, 60s. So, you know, it's the manufacturing era where, mm -hmm. where it's conveyor belts and engineering and just doing things faster. That also reflected in our mindset was how can I be more efficient? Mm. Now, efficiency is good. All things being equal, doing things faster is great. The problem is that there is a point of diminishing returns mm -hmm. to using efficiency as your only strategy for productivity. Right. Um, which is that no matter how fast we move, the, the amount of busy work always expands to fill the amount of time available. Right. So it's more like quicksand. It's just kind of like the faster you go or the more that shows up. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be fast. It's just not going to get you what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, in the late 80s, Dr. Stephen Covey wrote a book that changed the world. Um, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with it and sold tens of millions of copies. And Dr. Covey pretty much single-handedly in, single introduced a new era of time management thought um, that we, ref, you know, the world refers to as prioritizing. Yes. But we would classify prioritizing as era two thinking, which is still to this day the predominant strategy that most people use in terms of how they think about time. And so here's here's what prioritizing is: it's to focus first on what matters most. Mm -hmm. Super powerful, super relevant. Dr. Covey had this thing called the time management matrix that you know he explained of like urgency and importance, and basically he taught us to score our activities yes. so that we could reorder them and say, ah, it's mm -hmm. not just about getting these done faster. It's saying, hey, item number seven needs to be pushed to, to item number one, which is valuable. And so that's super valuable. Um, prioritizing is, important, is as important today as ever before. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed in my own life, because I was a student of Dr. Covey and several books on time, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of books on time management. There's no shortage of apps. Uh, there's all these tips and tricks and mm. tools and technology that exist to help us with this problem of feeling so busy. And yet mm, the majority of us are still overwhelmed. Right. So it's like there's something <clears throat> missing. And what we started to notice in these, these ultra performers that we now refer to as the multipliers is that they're they are doing a different type of thinking. It's like evolution, like their, their thinking has evolved. Um, from, for almost all of them, it was subconscious. And- They weren't even aware of it. Not even aware of it. Uh, it wasn't something that someone taught them to do. They did it instinctively, you know, like instinctually. They, 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 they figured out, and, and most of them couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain it to me and they couldn't explain it to most people if they said, why are you, how are you so productive, right? Mm. Like how does, you know, how do you become a billionaire in 10 years when like most people work for 40 years and you know, they, they can barely retire. Right. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different type of thinking. And one of the things, this is true in many areas of our life, the next level of results always requires the next level of thinking. Mm -hmm. So here's what it is. So era three time management is multiplying. It's not efficiency, it's not prioritizing, it's multiplying. And it's all based on what we call the significance calculation. So it's really, it's not, a, it's adding on like Dr. Covey's work as an example. So he, you know, presents this two dimensional figure like a square um, where the Y axis is importance and the X axis is urgency. But what multipliers are doing is they're making a, a third calculation, mm -hmm. which we call significance. So it's kind of like um, if you're doing algebra, it would be the Z axis. It would turn the square into a cube. Three dimensional. Three dimensional thinking, era three thinking or three dimensional thinking. And so here's the difference. Urgency is how soon does this matter? Most of us live in a world of urgency. It's all about what needs to be done right now. Importance is different. Importance is how much does this matter? Mm. But significance is even different still. Significance is how long is this going to matter? So 
how is what is the impact of this activity in the future? Mm -hmm. Ten and, years out, twenty years out, even ten days out. Yeah, right. it's it's it is breaking free of the paradigm of one day, and instead thinking about tomorrow yeah. and the next day. And the significance calculation changes everything because this is how it's possible to multiply time. Uh, so I mean, I'll just tell you in, sure. in one sentence. Okay, so if you say, Rory. How is it possible to multiply time? This is the answer. So write, you want to you write, this, write this part down. You don't want to miss this. The way you multiply time is by giving yourself the emotional permission to spend time on things today that create more time tomorrow. You do, you do, there's certain things you do right now that create more time in the future. That's the significance calculation. Um, so when I say multiply time, people often think I'm exaggerating or that it's like a marketing hyperbole, right? That is, I'm like, I'm sensationalizing a, a concept. Mm -hmm. when, when, when we say this, we're not exaggerating. We mean this literally. Now, it kind of fries your brain because you go, you've been told your whole life, you can't, time is the one thing you, you can never get back. It's right. the one thing you can never get more of. Um, and it is true that there's nothing that we can do, there's nothing I can do to, to give you more time inside of one day. So one day is finite and we're all limited by the same 24 hours, mm -hmm. um, which by the way is 1,440 minutes or 86,400 seconds. Okay. So I can't teach you to create more, I don't have control over time, right? There's no such thing as time management, there's only self-management, but that's exactly the problem is most of us think about our activities in the paradigm mm. of one day. We wake up and we say, what's the most important thing I can do today? And it's not that that's a bad question. It's just not the question that multipliers ask. Mm. Multipliers don't say, what is the, the most important thing I can do today? Multipliers ask, what are the things I can do today that create more time tomorrow? Mm. What are the things I can do now that make the future better? you're literally breaking free of the urgency paradigm of just what matters right here, right now, and you're introducing the significance paradigm of what is gonna have impact over the long haul. Right, how do you know which actions to focus on urgently that will have impact over the long haul? Yeah. So when you've got everything significant, Yes, so, uh, well, there's a, there's a tool called the Focus Funnel yeah. um, that uh, we developed here to help people apply this. Yeah. So, so, so the, there's only one big idea in this whole conversation, which is spend time on things today that give you more time tomorrow. That's how you multiply time. Um, then, and then you go, how do I do that? Um, and there's five, five, there's five core methods, strategies. We call them uh, permissions yes. because there's an um, emotional side. What we've also learned is that mm -hmm. most people treat time management logically. <laughs> but it's actually an emotional conversation. Yeah. Um, m for most of us, it's, it's not just our calendar and our inbox and our to-do list. It is our, our under, underlying <laughs> feelings of guilt and fear and anxiety and worry, as well as ambition and our, 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 our drive to be successful and feel valued and important and to make you know, impact mm -hmm. in the world. These underlying emotional drivers dictate as much as, as dictate how we spend our time and the choices that we make as much as anything on our to-do list. What do we feel most guilty about? We feel most guilty um, about not doing something that we want to do, about delaying something, about wasting our time. I would say the guilt. So guilt corresponds with the first of the, the five permissions, which is eliminate. Okay. So if you, if you were to picture a funnel, okay, so if I was going to draw this out, right, like you think of all of the stuff there is to do comes into the top. Um, and then the focus funnel is our attempt to create a visual illustration that codifies the thought process that multipliers go through intuitively in their own brain mm -hmm. so that, that the rest of us can kind of like see it and follow it. So the very first question is, can this be eliminated? Um, so give me an example of your life or someone's business or career or whatever it might be? There's tons of things. I mean, in your personal life, I mean, I, 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 used, I like the example of TV because 
it's 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 a hilarious how people will in the same dinner conversation talk about how they're so busy and married and overwhelmed and then talk about the three series uh, on Netflix that they have binged in like the last month. Right. And um, which you know, took twenty hours of their life. Yeah. And and so it's like okay. I'm, and I'm not saying you shouldn't watch TV. By the way, I'm not telling you anything you shouldn't sh- or shouldn't do. Right. I'm just introducing the framework for you to decide how to spend your time. But, but if you're saying you're too busy and overwhelmed, check to where you're spending your time the most. That's right. And then and, and Nielsen if says- If it's six hours on Instagram a day and you're not being, uh, you know, you're not creating something of significance and you're just browsing, or if you're 20 hours a week on TV and yeah. you're I'm overwhelmed and tired and exhausted, then just look at where you're spending your time. Yeah. yeah. And, and Nielsen ratings, you know, this was this is from a few years ago, but they said the average American watches 27 hours a week of television. A week? A week. It's a part-time job. So... 27 hours a week. How much is that a day? I mean, so, you know, seven, seven times, it's like four hours a day. Four hours a day of TV? It's like four hours a day. That's a ton. That's a lot of time. I mean, you could build a big side hustle in a couple hours every day. Legit. Get, even if you just cut half of that down. And you watch two hours a day of TV and you spend two hours on your side hustle or something else, your health, your relationships. Imagine the the benefits you would have down the line. So, yeah, there's anything. Eliminate is the first opportunity to multiply because anything I say no to today creates time in the future. Mm -hmm. How? It's preventing me from doing something that I would have otherwise been doing mm-hmm. had I not given myself the permission to eliminate, like yes. had I not said no. So basically this is, is saying no, and people really struggle with saying no. Um, in businesses, this happens all the time. People have all these, so you know, at Brand Builders Group, we do personal brand strategy, right? So we're coaching all these like people on uh, building and monetizing their personal brand. Well, they have like a hundred business models. It's like, oh, I want to have a video course and a membership site and a live event and consulting. And I want to do keynote speaking and and I want to get a book deal and and you know and sponsorships and brand deals and and it's like when you have diluted focus, you get diluted results. Mm-hmm. So you have to by saying no to some things, you power your ability to focus on the few significant things yes. that will multiply time. So you you have to say you have to say no. But this is something that people struggle with. Yeah. I struggle with it. Mm-hmm. You know. There's a, well, especially when you get to a certain level of success where there's a lot of opportunities and cool things and exciting things and new shiny objects, we want to do lots of things. Yeah. High achievers, people that have gotten out of the weeds of their life and they have different problems which are opportunity problems. Uh, again, first world problems. It's how do you focus your time and energy and making the decisions that you want to focus on now for your future. And that is a challenge in just making decisions. Decision fatigue is a thing for people and learning how to place importance on the things that you want to spend your time on is going to be key for you. Totally. And a lot of people, the decision fatigue, what happens is they it it, 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 it does wear on you. And so a lot of people don't make conscious decisions. So mm. what happens is... They make what? Emotional decisions? Reaction yes, decisions? Yes, they're unconscious emotional impulses, right? And if you're not <clears throat> consciously saying no to the things that don't matter, you end up unconsciously <clears throat> saying no to the things that do matter. What if everything matters to you? So, you know, that that's what I said, actually. So I... Um, I in in um, So we were... You know, this became the Procrastinate on Purpose book. So this mm. was my second book. Um, When we're profiling all these people, I was doing interviews and I told one of the multipliers, I said, I don't like this one. I, I got to where I am by being a yes man, by like doing a lot of things and doing them well and like saying yes to meetings and meeting people all the time. And, and they said, Rory, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I was like, Oh, okay. Um, and, and here's what they said. They said, you're trying to go through life without saying no, which is admirable because you're a nice, you're, you're a nice guy. But what you failed to realize is that you are always saying no to something. Mm. Anytime you say yes to one thing, you simultaneously are saying no to an infinite number of other things. Yes. So even when you think you're saying, yes, everything is important to me. No, nothing is important to you. Nothing is important enough for you to focus on. And you don't have a method for 
for focus and focus is power. So mm. that it, most of us are losing because we're wandering, we're meandering through a bunch of insignificant, trivial tasks, feeling productive when, when really we're just diluted. Right. Um, so if you, that's the first one, eliminate. Um, now, if you can't eliminate the task, then it drops down to the center of the focus funnel, which is automate, um, the permission to invest. And this is, this is so powerful because anything you create a process for today saves you time in the future. Yes. Now, we, if I set up a process for it or a system or if I write code, you know, there's a lot of automation like actual technologies and things that you can deploy. If I, if I take the time to set it up today, then tomorrow the system or the process is doing the thing instead of me. So yeah. it's multiplying time. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the challenge is that most of us are aware that those tools exist. But if you ask someone, Lewis, I mean, like if you ask the average business owner, or, you know, whatever, a, a, you know, achiever or you know, somebody pursuing greatness, are you aware of tools and systems and processes and technologies that you could imp implement or deploy or improve inside of your goals that would 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 automate things mm -hmm. they would all say yes but if you said why haven't you done it yet <laughs> what, what do you think they'd say uh, it's it's it takes too much time it takes it, too much time it's easier to do it myself right now just a couple minutes every day as opposed to Building figuring a system. Out the system, figuring out the software, learning it, going through the training, hiring someone, teaching them all the time and energy. I might as well just do it myself right now. Bingo. Yeah. So it's like they, they it's so ironic because the, the 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 two excuses we would use for why we haven't automated things is we would say I either I don't have the time or I don't have the Patience, money, the money, <laughs> the patience, the, the patience. We'll talk about in a second. Uh, the money. We talk I don't about have the time or the money. I don't have the time or the money. And it's wild because the, the those those two excuses we would use for not automating something mm -hmm. are exactly the opposite of how it is when you make the significance calculation. Because if you did do automate, you would save time or you would multiply time and you'd earn more money yeah. from your time doing something else. Yeah. So a, an easy example is bill pay. You know, this is yeah. a quick example. Yes. Right. So if you had two hours open in your day today and I said, Lewis, you know, what's the most important thing you could do today? You'd have a list of things that you would right, do. Right. And if I said, hey, I think you should consider setting up online bill pay. For most of us, we would be like, uh, no, like right. that is not important. That's not significant. That is seems totally trivial. Mm -hmm. But if you look at this the way a multiplier would, you go, OK. If you spend two hours today setting up online bill pay and it saves you 30 minutes every month from paying your bills in the future, then after four months time, you will have broken even 30, 30, 30, 30. You will have broken even on those initial two hours. And then every month thereafter, you'll get something that we call ROTI, return on time invested because now the system is doing the thing that you would have otherwise been doing. Another way that we say this, um, I know this is one of your, one of your favorite Rory-isms, is that automation is to your time exactly what compounding interest is to your money. Right. Automation is to your time what compounding interest is to your money. Just like compounding interest takes money and it turns it into more money. Automation takes time and it turns it into more time. Right. Just like nobody has extra money to invest. I mean, not nobody. There's some people are so rich. It's like, that's all they do. But the average person doesn't have, you know, an extra 10 grand just laying around to be like, yeah, I'm going to invest it. Usually you have to sacrifice something in the short term. You don't go on a trip. You don't buy the car. You don't buy the TV. And that is where you create the margin to reinvest mm -hmm. into you know, whatever the stock right. market and mutual right. funds, like real like, estate, real whatever. estate, whatever you, whatever you do. That is also how time is. Nobody has extra time to set up a system. You know, marketing automation is one of the big things we teach our clients. I know you guys mm -hmm. do a lot of it here. Um, we're experts in marketing automation. One of the reasons we became experts in it is we realized, oh my gosh, if I can build 
a, a, a funnel, you know, which is just a sequence, a series of emails and, you know, automating trust, basically, mm -hmm. um, giving value to people, then that system basically becomes like an employee for me that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's always out there. Um, but I don't have time to build it. And yet you only say that in the absence of significance. And that's what happens in the absence of the significance calculation. Yes. We inadvertently overweight the urgency calculation and we doom ourselves mm -hmm. to a lifetime sentence of always feeling busy because we're constantly making decisions only about what needs to get done today and mm. never thinking ahead via the significance calculation of tomorrow. As you're on this journey to build wealth, you have lit your own candle. Now you can help light someone else. You can help give someone a, a helping hand, whether you help someone financially, whether you help them with your time, whether you help them through your expertise because now you've learned the process because information is meant to be shared.